so I did what all of my professors told me not to do, and I have a lot of scripture. So there's actually one more story that I want to share, um, and it's from Matthew 26, uh, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them um, to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter, uh, James, and John with him, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. We've got to pray real quick. Father, thank you for uh, this family of believers. I thank you for the opportunity to be with them today. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you come now and you lead us back to Jesus. And Jesus, would you lead us to the Father? I thank you uh, so much for this uh, communion. Would you bless the Holy Spirit? We ask this in your name. Amen. So, in the first uh, few verses of Genesis, we get to read about God's creative brilliance as he spe He's speaking everything into existence. And at the end of every time, at the end of each day, he says, what? It was good. It was good. So it's interesting, actually, that, uh, and it probably should jump out to us, that when we come to this part when Jesus said, it is not good for man to be alone. How could Adam be in a perfect paradise with his creator and yet it not be good? I believe the answer to that statement could uh, lie in God's uh, statement to us and when he says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Who is, who is the us that God is talking about here? Who is he talking to? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Exactly. So Christian theologians throughout the centuries have pointed to this fact that uh, this is the, uh, where we find the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the first few passages of Scripture, we get to witness God's overflow of love, His uh, creative uh, brilliance that He brings uh, humans into existence. Uh, but again, it, it points back to why, why is Adam not good enough? Well, I believe this implies that um, though our relationship with the Father alone is good, it's not enough. So... Um, God creates Eve out of uh, the bone from Adam. And what does Adam say when he comes across to, to Eve? He says, at last, this is bone for my bone, flesh for my flesh. In other words, as some have proposed, he, what he's really getting at here is he's saying, you fill that void of loneliness within. And so here, the journey of friendship in Scripture is established. Um, so maybe uh, Genesis 1 could, could read something like this. In the beginning, there was friendship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet God wanted more friends. So being made in the image of the triune God means that we're capable of friendship with one another. Friendship with God, but also one another. It's important that we have both. Of course, we, we know that it, it took us, what, a few verses to mess it all up. Um, and one of the more tragic passages in all of Scripture uh, can be found when, in Genesis 1, verse 8. When the cool evening breeze or, sorry, this is chapter 2, were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden, so they hid from him among the trees. And he cried out, where are you? I've been fascinated. I, so Wilmore's kind of an interesting place. Have you all heard of the Enneagram? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. Well, if you go to Wilmore and you sit down at any table, the first thing that someone's, and I could ask your name, it's gonna be, <laughs> what's your number? Um, <laughs> And so I was curious. I looked up how many personality tests there are. There's over 25,000 or 2,500 uh, personality tests that you can take to find out more about yourself or more about your wife, your 
her husband. <laughs> um, well, why do we need personality tests? I wonder if it's because our, our generation uh, has lost the art of friendship and lost the art of conversation. So we have to ge generate personality tests in order to get to know one another better because we don't know how to have conversation with one another. Um, and so I think this all goes back to Genesis 1 uh, through chapter 3. Uh, some of the scholars in the room, they could, they could say something else. But I believe one of the main themes throughout all of Scripture is this journey uh, of God trying to restore this friendship that we had in the garden when we walked and we talked with Him. And so we get to the New Testament. And we uh, meet Jesus, uh, God in flesh. So Jesus comes to restore this fractured relationship um, with him, but also with one another. And we see Jesus in, at the start of his ministry start inviting people back to begin that walk with him that was once uh, started in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> and so I want to talk about... Um, well, introduce you to Jesus' ministry. Uh, more importantly, Jesus' friendship with uh, the disciples uh, and the crowd in general. So really quickly, you can uh, look at Jesus' ministry in almost three different layers. So he ministered to the crowds, and they were attracted to him uh, just by he raised people from the dead. He casted out demons. And so, as anybody would, you would probably be attracted to this man, but also Jesus called 12 disciples to him. And of course, we know that there were other closer disciples, but specifically scripture talks about these 12 disciples that walked with Jesus from town to town. They ate with him. Uh, Jesus taught him, taught all of the disciples. Um, but even more so from these three stories that were read, Jesus had uh, an inner circle, as some scholars like to call it, uh, Peter, James, and John. I, I'm just fascinated. Why, why did Jesus choose to draw close to these three men? And why does Scripture specifically make the point that he took them aside separately? What if, what's going on there? Um, and we know that these three men, Jesus clearly had an impact on them. They were the first that he called and he named. Uh, they encouraged Paul's mission to the Gentiles. They planted churches. They wrote letters that we still read today. And ultimately, these three men, they laid down their life for their friend, Jesus. So I believe what we find in Jesus and this relationship with Peter, James, and John um, is how he imparted his life to them so that they could, in return, pour out his love on the many. Now, this is not to say that uh, the 12 uh, weren't important, and this wasn't to say that the crowds, um, but there's something unique about Jesus' relationship with Peter, James, and John. So, I want to take a look at these three stories and kind of draw some things uh, out of them that I think apply to us today, but also the relationship that Jesus had with those disciples. And before I go any further, I want to talk about my wife and I are the co-directors of what's called the Inspire Movement in the USA. And essentially, uh, Richard was talking about his mentor, uh, Dr. Phil and Sam Meadows. They started this discipleship movement. And one of the core practices um, that they kind of established is what's called fellowship bands. And a fellowship band uh, is essentially a group of three to four spiritual friends uh, that gather together and it's, they do two things. They give an account of their walk with Jesus. So how are things going? What are some of your struggles, your, your praises, strength? And then the other thing that they do, after people share this story of discipleship, uh, the other people point them back to Jesus. And so this is kind of where I'm getting uh, 
all the stories and the, this is what I'm drawing from. So just so you know, I don't want it to be like this ambiguous, weird thing. Um, so we refer to band as what we call spiritual friends. Um, and so just as an aside before I get into it, we, we say that a spiritual friend is only spiritual because of the reality that God can be present with us. And so I want to look at the implications of Jesus's life with Peter, James, and John, and how we can uh, apply that to what we call a fellowship family. And so the first thing that you can draw out of these three stories is that Jesus drew close to Peter, James, and John so that they could draw close and see his ministry up firsthand. At the house of Jairus, they got to witness Jesus' ministry of compassion as he looked on to the, to the uh, mother and father. As you can imagine, imagine they were in anguish over this lost girl. They also got to see firsthand uh, Jesus' response to the mockers. And ultimately, they got to witness Jesus bind up the brokenhearted and raise this girl back to life. On the mount, they saw Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament and how now the most important thing for them is to know him. As they heard, this is my beloved son, what? Listen to him. In the garden, they got to witness Jesus' ministry of prayer and surrender. As he fell on his knees and prayed to the Father, they got to see firsthand um, what it looked like to be in surrender. But not only that, I wonder if uh, a light bulb went off when Jesus is praying out to the Father as he taught them, this is how you pray for times like this when you're in anguish. This is what it looks like uh, to have this intimate relationship with the Father when your life is falling apart around you. So why, do, why would we draw close uh, to one another in this fellowship band? Uh, we're convicted around, because when we draw close to one another, uh, Jesus, as he says, he promises that when two or three are gathered, there I am with you. Amen. What if Jesus actually meant where two or three were there? We often read like, the whole church, which is good. Uh, of course, Jesus is present now. His Holy Spirit is with us. But what if he actually meant there's something unique about the two or three? In band, uh, we gather, like I said, to, to share our ministry of discipleship with one another uh, and to help each other see Jesus in each other's life. Do you have a space that you can do that? Um, our culture doesn't make it easy for us to have uh, friends that are actually uh, deep and where you know each other, uh, still love each other no matter what. And I think part of the problem is uh, the rise of consumerism, uh, individualism, where as soon as somebody wrongs you, what do you typically, well, I typically see ya, uh, you're not beneficial to me anymore, and I'll, I'll just go my separate way. Um, there's something deeply uh, rooted in our culture where we keep people at a distance unless they're benefiting us and we'll draw close to them, and as soon as they don't, we'll just move on. So what would it look like uh, to have friends who, even if they take you off, <laughs> even if they wrong you, what would it look like to still be in relationship with them? Um, and of course, there's a lot of dynamics. So I, the overall gist, though, is we don't typically have friends who know us at a deep level, uh, even though we may fall or do something to harm them, that they still stick with us. So in a band, friendship with one another becomes the means by which we become friends with Jesus, where two or three are gathered, there I am with you. The second thing that we can draw from these three stories is uh, how Jesus invited Peter, James, and John into the depths of his soul. At the house of Jairus, they saw Jesus' little heart uh, for the girl. I kind of, my imagination is that they, they, were, they all three were witnessing Jesus do this miraculous thing. I wonder if Jesus 
he just didn't stand back. I kind of imagined him hovering over the girl and saying, get up. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, I wonder if they danced after he did that. Or <laughs> what did they do? Did they just say, okay, that's cool, let's go on. I don't know. On the mountain, they got to uh, witness Jesus and all of his glory, and they were able to revel in his joy. Do you have friends that you can revel in their joy? In the garden, they heard how Jesus shared his soul with them and that his soul was in sorrow, even unto death, he says. Why is it important for us today to share our soul with one another? Well, I believe it's because true spiritual friends are people who know us completely. They know us all the way down, and yet they still love us. This type of... Uh, Vulnerability obviously requires authenticity. And I, I believe that you, when you show up in the presence of Jesus, you have to be authentic because he knows you already completely. So what, what does it look like to invite uh, two or three other people into that relationship? Of course, again, what is our cultural moment? I do that. This podcast I love. It's a great one. You should check it out. <laughs> cultural moment. Um, what is our cultural moment? Why do we struggle at letting people kind of beneath the surface? Well, I wonder if it's because of cell phones and the rise of social media, where I could have 2,000 friends on Facebook, I could share something every day, but yet they probably only know 1% of my life, and the 1% that they do know is probably gonna be the best Percentage that I could share unless you know you get the occasional person who likes to share everything but typically uh, social media is a place where you can Almost be whatever you want It can be the person you dreamed you wanted to be or, or just what people see in you and then uh, with cell phones Well, we're good at texting and we're very connected people but yet we we kind of hide behind these I'm not saying they're all bad and evil, but where is the line? How do we actually uh, develop strong relationships with people in the culture of uh, the internet? And yeah, so I still think we need to have a presence and we need to be people who are spreading the gospel in those areas. But Jesus invited his friends to know them deeply. So in band, we invite friends to know us completely and trust that they'll share the love of Christ with us and lead us back to him. The third thing that Jesus invited Peter, James, and John into is to share in his mission and his goal in life. At the house of Jairus, uh, Jesus' disciples learned that uh, joining his mission to the world would mean binding up the brokenhearted, unveiling the eyes of the lost, and ultimately sharing the same love with others. From their mountaintop experience, they learned that uh, the journey of discipleship is about staying in step with Jesus. And it can be tempting to worship Jesus' blessings in our life instead of Jesus himself. Mm. You know, they were tempted uh, as they uh, witnessed this miraculous thing. Why don't we set up a, what they call it, not a temple, a tabernacle. Why don't we worship? I wonder if Jesus has left some of us because he walked down the mountain and we're still up worshiping things that were one amazing god did an amazing work in our life maybe 20 years ago but we're still up on the mountain and jesus he he walked he kept walking down mm. i think it's easy to start worshiping the blessings of jesus mm. that he does for us in our life and forget to actually follow him mm -hmm. on a day in day out basis in the garden, they learned uh, that following Jesus isn't an easy path. In fact, Jesus, he never promises us a comfortable life in this world. What he does promise, though, in his great commission as he sends out his disciples, his, as he sends out his friends to befriend the others, he makes an amazing promise that we often overlook. What? That he will be with us always to the end of the age. So what does it look like for us to join Jesus' mission and his goal in life? Well, 
Uh, we talk about in our movement how it, it means following Jesus more faithfully in the day to day. And it means choosing friends who share these same goals in life. So it's about sharing the values. It's about facing the same fears with one another. Um, and ultimately, spiritual friends are able to offer us wise counsel because they share the same goal in life and because they're walking with us and uh, doing life with one another. C.S. Lewis, he insisted that the essence of friendship is the exclamation, me too. In other words, as Tim, Ke Tim Keller says, any two Christians with nothing else in common but a, a faith in Christ can have a robust friendship, hmm. helping each other on the journey toward the new creation as well as doing ministry together in the world. Hmm. So for this reason, it can be very difficult to hold true to our faith and walk with Jesus on a day in and day out basis if we don't have friends who help us keep our eyes on him. Amen. We need friends who can help us follow Jesus. Now don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we don't befriend uh, people who don't know Jesus. But we have to have uh, friendships in our life where they can help us uh, stay on the narrow path. Because the, the culture around us, it's very easy for us to get uh, Swerve and to, and to miss the mark. So in band, we gather to help one another uh, fix our eyes on him, the one who uh, raises the dead and the one who speaks life into us. And the last thing, uh, Jesus needed companions on the way. At the house of Jairus, uh, Jesus didn't invite them in because he was lonely or he was scared of of the opportunity. Rather, he chose to include them on the presence because he actually wanted them to be with him. Mm. Jesus chose uh, his friends to go up to the mountain because he wanted them to share in his joy. In the garden, Jesus, Jesus chose to open up his life because he needed friends to watch over his soul. So today, uh, why do we need companions? For us and bands, uh, it's about becoming servants of one another. It's where we practice hospitality, where we bear one another's burdens. We offer comfort, provide encouragement, and speak the truth in love. And I truly believe uh, when John Wesley said, there is no such thing as being a solitary Christian. In other words, we need the help of others to pursue Jesus' way of life. And we need the help of others because we're easily distracted. Um, the journey of discipleship is not easy. So I wanted to basically finish by just sharing some practical things. Uh, I started a fellowship band. Well, I met Dr. Meadows three years ago, and I've been in a band with him uh, ever since. And something amazing happens in a band because we do believe that when we gather together that Jesus is actually present. Um, and just some things in my life that I once struggled with on a day in and day out basis, um, things and thought patterns and sinful, destructive things that I would do in my life, uh, I'm free from it now because of my band members leading me back to Jesus, speaking truth and love to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe I could have been in a sort of environment like that because of my, I just don't trust a lot of people. And so for me, a, a band is a space for me to be my true self. Um, and another thing that I would say about walking on a journey with other friends that, that you have is that a couple things happen. You Friend, so and one of the questions we ask each other in a fellowship band is, how is your soul? And I hate that question. I really do. Because <laughs> I don't want to tell you that. Um, but what's happened in my life is that I'm able to connect the dots of what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. And in return, I've, I've been able to join Jesus on the day-to-day. -day, and I'm more attentive to what he's doing in me and through other people as well because of the 
uh, the fact that when we gather together, what we're doing is having a spiritual conversation, having conversation about our walk with Jesus, but also how how to spur one another on towards uh, love and good deeds. So I want to go back to Genesis 1. God asks Adam and Eve, as they are hid in their shame and brokenness, he asks the question, where are you? Could God be asking us today, where are you? I want to walk again with you. But I don't want to just do it with you. I want to do it with you and Peter, James, and John. And so what we always ask in our, our movement is, who are your Peter, James, and John? Do you have people in your life um, that can walk with you and help you become more like Jesus and live more missionally in the world? Do you have that person? And so I often wonder if we fail in our discipleship to Jesus because we try to do it by ourselves. After all, this is a, an American idol that we're the self-made people, right? We did it ourselves. Where Jesus, Jesus' life was not like that. He was a, a man of complete surrender and obedience to the, the Father, and he lived in the power of the Spirit. Um, and so what if the greatest thing we can offer one another is the gift of friendship? Hmm. In a generation that there's not many people who have close friendships. In fact, I, I've done some, a little research with Dr. Meadows <laughs> about just the statistics on friendship in our culture, and there's less than 3% of people that the research and data shows that they have someone in their life that they trust completely, they know them in and out. They're less than 3% in our culture. And that's been a decline of like six, I want to say 50 to 60% over the last 50 years. So something something is going on to, to the fact of that not many of us have these close relationships in our life. So I want to end by just inviting you into this practice of fellowship there. It can be one of the most impactful things you ever do in your journey of discipleship to Jesus. Um, and I believe that we can learn from these three stories. Jesus needed, should I say, he wanted three other people to do life with. Are we above our master? Do we have a uh, space in our life where we can help one another uh, pursue him? grow more in his likeness. Amen.